Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Today we are having a look at a slightly different paper compared to usual. It's entitled Association between Operative Autonomy of Surgical Residents and Patient Outcomes and was recently published in JAMA Surgery. I'm sure it's a topic that's uh, relevant for everyone, not just uh, general surgery trainees. Uh, Prof Saba is then going to talk about evidence-based medicine. And this is the second part uh, of multiple sessions we'll be running on EBM. I'll leave you to it. Okay, uh, awesome, then we'll, we'll get cracking. Uh, I'm Josh, I'm a, a CT2 uh, working at Pinderfields. Uh, and you got in touch with me about this and uh, has given me the opportunity to present with him to you, which I'm very thankful for. Um, the paper that uh, we've chosen uh, was published uh, a couple of weeks ago in JAMA Surgery. And as you can see, it looks at the uh, association between operative autonomy of surgical residents uh, and the uh, outcomes of the patients uh, that they operate on. Uh, Joe's just going to tell you a little bit about the, the context that this paper was written in. Yeah, I mean, there's a variety of, uh, of topics related to residents and generally sort of trainees' autonomy uh, in the operating room. Uh, it's a complex relationship between trainees, trainers, and to a certain extent outcomes as well. Um, we know that competence develops during training years, so it's not a process that's uh, particularly short. It takes a long time. There's a, a big difference between being competent and being entrusted at doing something, uh, particularly if you are left on your own. And some people are competent, but are not entrusted, and some people are entrusted, but then obviously because uh, the competence is not up to speed, um, have to give up uh, on the operation and the operation gets taken over by their trainer. Um, competence is also very much context dependent. Uh, and I'm sure all trainees have experienced that if you're operating with a certain person and you do the exact same operation with another person, your degree of competence will be different as perceived by yourself and by your trainer. Uh, and that changes by hospital and hospital as well. And finally, the big question that probably this paper kind of centers on is competence and outcomes. And now everything that we just kind of mentioned um, can translate into real life um, outcomes for patients. So hopefully this paper will, will shed some light on, on this problem. Uh, Ball, back to you, Josh. Uh, so uh, looking at the aims, this is the importance as, as stated by the by the authors and probably gives a little bit of uh, a little bit of their motivation behind going into uh, looking at this issue. Uh, they feel that resident operative autonomy has been steadily decreasing. Uh, and then the question that they're asking is whether this reduction uh, has been associated with changes uh, in, in patient outcomes. Uh, and the aim of the study was to assess these, uh, any differences that they might find uh, comparing surgeries performed by residents or what we might call in the UK registrars and surgeons, which are consultants. Uh, the PICO uh, sort of format uh, sort, of, sort of fits here. If we consider P to be the, uh, the population uh, who were operated on uh, from the, the database that we'll come to in a second, uh, the intervention group being the, the resident as the uh, primary uh, person doing the, the surgery. And then there were two control arms. So one was the, the surgeon or the consultant uh, performing the operation uh, as the primary surgeon. And then the, the second control arm uh, was the uh, resident and the surgeon performing the operation uh, alongside uh, each other, uh, and then there was a primary outcome was 30-day uh, uh, mortality, and then there were a couple of other uh, secondary outcomes, uh, such as uh, various uh, morbidities, uh, and a couple of others that we'll come to a little bit later on as well. 
Uh, Gio's just going to talk now a little bit about uh, the methods uh, this study. Excellent. So uh, as Josh mentioned, this is a retrospective cohort study uh, with a primary outcome being the 30-day or cause mortality. And this is conducted extracting data from the VASQIP database, which is a very large veteran affairs uh, surgery quality improvement um, project data set, uh, which is primarily designed as a quality improvement tool, as the name would suggest. Uh, exclusion criteria, as you can see on the right, are basically a procedure performed at non-teaching units, uh, procedures where, where there was a missing supervisor code uh, in the data set. Some specialty procedures, like they cut off transplant, cardiac, anesthetic, like blocks and stuff like that, uh, oral surgery and podiatry. Kids were also excluded and patients with ASA 6 because uh, uh, they are already dead. So uh, obviously the primary outcome wouldn't be uh, applicable. Uh, and they um, extract the data from the data set and perform a propensity matching for 30 characteristics. There's quite a lot of them, uh, actually. And the salient ones are operation, obviously, uh, age of the patient, functional status, a variety of comorbidities, and uh, the type of procedure in terms of wound cleanliness. Uh, and they create these three cohorts, resident alone operating, surgeon alone, um, and uh, surgeon and resident operating. The biggest group of the three is surgeon plus resident, uh, with a variety of sort of interactions possible between the two, really. Um, the smallest group is resident alone. And as you can see from the numbers, they start from uh, almost 2 million, they go to uh, just over a million uh, after exclusion. And the propensity matched uh, procedures for resident alone versus surgeon alone are about 100,000, uh, including 73% of resident alone procedures. So 30% roughly of them were taken out. 99% of resident alone procedure were then matched with surgeon plus resident. So that's, that's pretty good in terms of BSM. Um, despite propensity score matching, there's still quite a few differences between um, groups um, on a variety of variables. We won't go into much details for time reasons, but uh, there are differences between the groups uh, that are compared here. Uh, so let's have a look at what type of procedures these um, residents have actually been performing these registrars. So as you can see, this is the top 10 that we have selected. The vast majority of these procedures are urology related. Uh, so TRBT and TURPs, TRBT in a variety of sort of sizes um, are predominant. Uh, lap coles and umbilical hernias are there as well in a variety of orthopedic operations. So it tends to be relatively sort of minor surgery. Uh, ball back to you, um, Josh, for more results. Yeah, so just looking uh, at uh, some of the uh, results, um, the primary outcome uh, as you can see, uh, showed uh, no significant difference. Uh, odds ratio of 1.03. This is uh, looking at the resident uh, operating as the primary surgeon versus the uh, consultant surgeon uh, operating as the primary surgeon. And then you can also just see below uh, some of the secondary outcomes that they looked at composite morbidity. Uh, there's a very long list that we'll see in a second return to theater, uh, length of stay and operative time. Uh, as you can uh, see, a return to theatre was uh, slightly uh, commoner uh, if the resident was first operating, and that has a statistically significant result. Uh, and the median operating time was slightly longer uh, when the uh, consultant surgeon was the primary operator. That's also a statistically significant result. Um, and I'm sure we can, we can think of various reasons uh, why those differences uh, might exist. Uh, over to you, Joe, just to talk about some of the complications. Yeah, just a brief mention. Uh, obviously, this is quite a crowded table. Uh, the uh, sort of salient results, the one that's uh, statistically significant, is that uh, bleeding uh, requiring more than four units of blood was actually more common in the surgeon primary group. Um, this could be a reflection of potentially being more difficult cases. Hard to say, really. It's, it's a number. Uh, and what I highlighted at the bottom of the table is really a set of complications that are somehow correlated with technical ability, like foundations, particularly the foundations, uh, and surgical site infections. And as you can see, there is no real significant difference. Some superficial space surgical site infections slightly more common 
uh, in uh, the resident primary group, and that's about it. Uh, so, Paul, back to you, Josh. Uh, so now just looking at the uh, second uh, part of the study, which is comparing when the resident operates alone uh, versus when the surgeon and resident operate uh, together. Uh, once again, 30 day old cause mortality, uh, no uh, significant difference there. Uh, and then a couple of uh, differences uh, looking at some of the secondary uh, outcomes, uh, composite morbidity uh, higher in the surgeon uh, plus resident group, uh, the length of stay, uh, and also the uh, operative time. There were significant differences uh, in those cohorts there. The interquartile range is just in brackets for you to see. And uh, once again, looking you know, at the uh, at the complications uh, in this uh, group of, uh, yeah. of operations. Yeah, very briefly, there's only really a couple of statistically relevant results. Uh, one is again bleeding um, more than four units, which is again more common in the surgeon plus resident, and uh, uh, mechanical ventilation 48 hours after procedure, which is uh, again showing a similar trend, more common in the surgeon plus resident group. Again, this could just reflect a different in complexity of the procedures. And again, um, sort of complications that are potentially related to technical issues um, are pretty much equal in the two groups. Ball back to you again, Josh. Yeah, sure. Um, so limitations, there are a number of self-reported limitations which I'll just run through quickly. Uh, first and foremost, no data on long-term outcomes. Uh, so this was looking at 30-day uh, as a primary outcome. Um, and then the secondary outcomes would all have, have occurred uh, within the first uh, month of, of uh, po the post-operative course. Um, so, for example, uh, recurrence of a, of a hernia or, uh, you know, an incomplete resection or something uh, wouldn't be featured uh, in this, which is obviously quite a significant uh, outcome for a patient undergoing surgery. Uh, second of all, uh, the way that the, uh, the uh, coding was done for the database meant that it didn't account for if during the procedure, if a resident had started operating and then called a bus in halfway through because there were difficulties, that would still be recorded as a resident primary. And um, so there's a bit of an issue with the data set there. Uh, additionally, as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, confounders within the patient baseline uh, characteristics. So they couldn't always compare uh, like with like when it came to patients, despite the propensity matching. Uh, and the final point is that we don't really have any detail uh, on the surgeon plus resident cases of actually how much the residents were involved uh, when compared to the to the consultant to the to the consultant surgeons. Uh, Jill, you can run down the uh, the other issues that we found. Yeah. So first of all, I think we should make a point on how relevant this is to our own reality. So external validity of this paper might be limited by the way our training is designed. Um, there is a point that I think is probably the most important point, actually, the authors kind of mention on. Uh, they cannot account for the resident stage of training. So effectively, um, the equivalent of, an, of a CT1 and an SD6 would be pretty much in the same pot here. And obviously, the level of competence and the level of independence would be very different. Uh, they do run quite a few tests. So I think there is an issue of multiple statistical testing potentially. Um, however, well, the authors just don't mention it particularly uh, throughout their discussion. Now, we do know that competency is contextual. But we mentioned that at the beginning, there's a fairly big body of evidence in medical education to suggest that. And here, this is, this is very important because uh, we're not just talking about more than a thousand hospitals involved in the generation of the Vascript, Vascript database, but also a very long time frame. So from 2004 almost to 2020. Uh, obviously, things have changed a lot, and the authors cannot really account and do not really account for changes in time um, that are related to the context of where these procedures are performed. It'd be almost impossible to do, but it's worth mentioning, I think. Uh, there is an issue with data granularity. So the quality of the data in the database is somehow affected by the fact that the data set is not generated for these purposes, a quality improvement uh, database. And the authors a couple of times through the paper mentioned that uh, 
Um, yes, there are trained nurse specialists that do input data in the data set, but ultimately um, the data is extrapolated from operation nodes and it's a surgeon driven process. So obviously this adds layers of interpretation to who was the primary surgeon. Uh, the surgeon himself writing the operation note and also whoever goes to the op note and then translates that into the data set. Um, and finally, a minor point, uh, the authors use uh, odds ratios throughout their paper. Um, I believe they could have used relative risks. Uh, odds ratios tend mathematically to be higher than relative risks. Uh, and they tend to sort of give an impression of it being, um, of the risk being higher uh, compared to relative risk. Uh, so ball to you, Josh, for conclusions. Yeah, so these are the uh, conclusions uh, as stated by the authors, that procedures performed by residents uh, by themselves uh, were not associated with changes in all-cause morbidity uh, or 30-day mortality when compared with surgeon loan or surgeon resident. Um, and they've said that resident autonomy and good patient outcomes are not incompatible. Um, and we just summarised that in the box below some of the uh, some of the things that we thought uh, advantages or positive things about the study and some negatives as well, uh, which we've discussed. So during the discussion uh, concerning this paper, uh, there were a few additional points that were highlighted. Uh, we focused on the fact that, uh, as mentioned, this is a multi-centre trial involving 17 centres from different countries pretty much all throughout Europe. Uh, this does have some implications related particularly to the um, variability of expertise and volume in different centres, which becomes particularly important when we are comparing laparoscopic and open approaches. Now, the authors mentioned that the um, number of procedures that a consultant surgeons need to have performed before enrolling in this trial uh, is 25. However, it is very likely that uh, there will be significant differences between um, various centres involved. And this um, could significantly affect the results concerning biological and synthetic mesh. As in terms of comparing those two particularly, uh, you ideally would want the most homogeneous background possible. A further point we discussed um, is related by the uh, choice of a composite outcome. Uh, traditionally, in uh, um, hernia trials, uh, particularly for uh, groin hernias, uh, recurrence has been used as the uh, main outcome for a study. So we are wondering why uh, the authors would choose a composite outcome rather than simply focusing on uh, uh, recurrences. This does have implications, particularly for sample size calculations, that it makes the primary outcome itself more common. And finally, we discuss the sample size calculations issues which we highlighted how uh, are particularly challenging in the context of a two by two factorial design trial. So we will be asking the authors for um, clarifications and we will let you know. Stay tuned for more. I'll leave you with Professor Sala teaching session. Thanks. And we'll talk about um, introduction to evidence-based practice. This is the second um, presentation on, on introduction to EBM. Can you see my screen? Yes. Lovely. Right, so um, what I'm going to do for this talk is talk about study designs again. We briefly mentioned study designs during the initial introduction, for part one. So you can go back and have a look at that uh, YouTube uh, video if you're interested. And then I will mention the five steps of evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice and um, explore just the first step today. So we'll tell you what the steps are and talk about the first step. Okay, so like I said, we've talked about study designs before. And when we're talking about study designs, uh, we're limiting our discussion to clinical uh, study designs. So if you remember, we talked about observational studies and experimental or interventional studies. And then we lumped a few other study designs under the uh, category of miscellaneous. So under observational studies, um, you've got uh, studies that can be called case control studies, and then you've got your cohort studies, 
and uh, cross-sectional studies. These are the three main types of observational studies that we need to know uh, about. And then there are these ecological and proportional mortality studies uh, that I've uh, added to the list just, for, just to mention. Uh, we don't come across many surgical uh, research that fall under this category. The next uh, group of studies are the experimental studies where there is an intervention that aims to uh, change the natural history of the disease process. They could be single arm studies. They could be two arms or more than two arm studies that are done uh, with at least one arm being the control uh, group. And if uh, in a control trial, you uh, introduce the, uh, uh, the methodology of randomization, you get a randomized control trial. And another type of uh, control trial uh, or randomized control trial is a time series or a before and after trial. Again, in uh, surgical research, this is an uncommon uh, type of uh, intervention study. Finally, in the miscellaneous category, you've got validation studies, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and economic analysis. So this is just a very uh, brief overview of the type of um, study designs that uh, will come across in surgical literature. Now, um, why do we have so many different study designs? Now, clearly these designs have different purposes. Um, so the purposes could be uh, that you explore a particular phenomenon or um, a, a particular group of patients uh, versus you test, you test a hypothesis in, in a group of patients. So the uh, basic research purpose could be exploratory versus hypothesis testing. So you, you get different kinds of study designs for these different kinds of basic purposes. The other um, a kind of stratification of purpose is primary research versus secondary research. Obviously, um, if you're doing a systematic review or meta-analysis, that would be secondary research. And there you acknowledge that there, there is already a number of papers on the topic and you want to collate the evidence and you want to submit the evidence and therefore you'll be doing what we call um, a secondary research. And a systematic review would be a typical example of secondary research. Whereas if there is no prior data available, no prior studies, then you're doing an observational study or an interventional study, which would be primary research, right? So that's another reason for having different study designs. Also, different designs answer different types of research questions. And I'll explore this in a bit more detail when I come to uh, talking about research questions in a few minutes. Finally, um, there is differences in feasibility. For example, if you take a randomized controlled trial versus a um, cohort study, a cohort study is much more easier to do. And there is uh, uh, less ethical issues involved compared to a randomized controlled trial. And, and, uh, and less money involved as well compared to a randomized control trial. Again, if you compare a cohort study with a case control study, a case control study is much more easier and quicker to do compared to a cohort study. So there are these differences in feasibility and, and then therefore the need to uh, do um, a particular uh, design or prefer a particular design over, over the others. Okay, so these are some of the reasons why you've got so many different study designs. And we, we've got to recognize that each design has its own unique set of advantages, disadvantages, and its own place in the so-called hierarchy of evidence. Now, a number of you would have come across this particular pyramid or the so-called hierarchy of evidence, where at the top of the hierarchy, you've got your meta-analysis and systematic reviews upon which you base your clinical practice guidelines. And going down the hierarchy, you have the randomized controlled trials, the cohort studies, case control studies, case series, and so on. So essentially, uh, it is considered that the higher you are in this pyramid, the higher is the quality of evidence you get from these studies, okay? This is not necessarily true and that's why some people don't like the phrase hierarchy um, when it comes to um, mapping these studies uh, on, in this uh, kind of pyramid. And the reason for that is you can do a really well-conducted cohort study that actually gives you better quality evidence 
compared to a poorly conducted randomized control trial. So although RCTs in general uh, sit uh, at a higher level in the hierarchy of evidence, um, at the end of the day, it's not just um, the fact that it is a randomized controlled trial, the design has to be in a such a way that uh, the trial is valid, um, both from an internal validity perspective as well as from a perspective of generalizability or external validity. So in addition to its place in the hierarchy, a number of other factors will determine the quality. And therefore, we shouldn't uh, just completely rely on the fact that a study is an RCT and, and then assume that it has to be better than a cohort study when it comes to addressing a specific question. So, um, so for every study design, you can have a quality rating. And there are many ways in which quality has been assessed and studies have been categorized into different uh, levels of quality. But uh, an approach that is used by many people um, recently is this classification into um, one of these four different quality ratings, high quality, moderate quality, low quality, and very low quality. Okay, so um, there's a lot in the literature about how quality of um, studies have to be assessed, how quality of evidence or certainty of evidence have to be assessed. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this um, in this talk, but I'll refer you to a website called gradeworkinggroup.org. And this is an internationally recognized working group that sets out a system and they call it the grade system. And that stands for grading of recommendations, assessment, development and evaluation system. And this is a system that is being proposed as a way to rate the quality of evidence of a group of studies in a review, for example. And then um, how to grade um, the strength of recommendations that are derived from um, putting together the evidence from all of these studies, right? So this system has been developed primarily for use by people involved in doing systematic reviews and people involved in writing clinical practice guidelines. However, there's a lot of data on, uh, there's a lot of information, I should say, and detail uh, on their website as to how to assess uh, the quality of evidence from published studies that you might find useful. Okay, now um, just a couple of uh, additional points, um, primarily from the grade group that I thought would be worth highlighting, is that like I said before, uh, the grade group um, recommends that you categorize quality into these four groups, high quality, moderate quality, low quality, and very low quality. Essentially, that would be based on how confident you can be that the effect that you're uh, reporting your systematic review or you're quoting from the study is uh, close to the true effect uh, in the population, okay? So if you're very confident, then you call it high quality, moderately confident, moderate quality, and so on and so forth. And what GRADE proposes is that if you have a study design, say an RCT, uh, by definition, you should be allocating um, the RCT to a high quality of evidence and compared to an observational study, which would automatically be allocated to a low quality of evidence, right? But then you don't stop there. You then look at a number of different factors, and these factors are listed in these two cells, which can either increase um, your, uh, your quality, for example, if you have an observational study which you've categorized to low quality, then if the effect is very large, for example, in the observational study, and if there's evidence of dose response gradient and all possible confounding factors have been accounted for, then you can increase the quality rating of the observational studies to high. And the same, uh, on the same basis, if you have a randomized control trial, but there is a significant risk of bias, or if the estimate is not very precise, or if you're suspecting publication bias in that negative uh, results have not been published, then you can, sorry, then you can lower the quality that you will um, assign uh, for the RCT 
um, uh, based on these factors. So in, in addition to saying that randomized controlled trials um, should be allocated a higher priority, they emphasize that you have to look into a number of other factors into how the study has been done and how the results have been reported, and then you can change the um, uh, end quality assessment if you like. Okay, let's now move on to the five steps of evidence-based medicine. You may already have heard of these steps, um, but I'll just repeat them for completion's sake. You've got the first step where you ask the right question. You've got the second step, acquire, where you go about acquiring the evidence um, from the studies that uh, have been done on this particular topic, on your problem, um, to then move on to the third step where you appraise the evidence, you interpret the data, and then you apply the results of uh, the evidence that you've collected to your own clinical problem or to your uh, clinical question. And essentially these four steps are the steps in, in practicing evidence-based medicine to be able to help you make decisions in the care of the individual patient or the patient in front of you. And then you evaluate the process, you, you um, reassess and see how you're able to incorporate and the evidence basis in your clinical practice. Um, and, and that's the final evaluation process. Okay, so this is a um, process that we acquire through practice. Um, it, it's not uh, of much value just to read about evidence-based medicine and forget about it. If we um, get into the habit of uh, generating uh, questions from the problems we encounter and go through the process of acquiring the evidence to answer the questions, appraising the evidence, applying it to the care of our individual patients and reflect upon the process, then you say that you, you know, you're practicing evidence-based medicine. Okay, so what we're gonna do for the next few minutes is simply talk about the first step, asking the question. And then let's do that with an example. So for surgical listeners, um, this wouldn't be an unfamiliar example. Let's say you've got somebody with the right elect force of pain and tenderness. Let's say you've got a 30 year old male, you've assessed the patient in, in a &E or or in the surgical assessment center, and you think, right, this is probably acute appendicitis. And let's say you get some investigations done and lo and behold, the white cell count is normal, the CRP is normal, you've got asked for a scan, uh, an ultrasound or a CT scan, let's say that's normal as well. You're probably then thinking, right, what do I do next? This is uh, somebody I thought had appendicitis, but all of the tests, the inflammatory markers that I've requested are negative, the scans are negative. So you're probably be, uh, going to be asking yourself a number of questions. Um, it could be that does this patient actually have appendicitis? Uh, or in other words, what's the probability that this patient still has appendicitis given a normal white cell count CRP and CT scan? You could then say, well, even if he has appendicitis, does it really matter? Could he have any other alternative pathology that could be significant? Could you discharge the patient? Could you reassure and discharge with just some advice to come back if there's a problem? What's the um, safety uh, of that approach? The efficacy of that approach? What's the likelihood that the patient is going to come back with the perforated appendicitis? And that wouldn't be a very nice scenario, would it? Um, and you're probably also thinking, young patient, male patient, should we just do an appendicectomy or at least put a laparoscope in just to be sure and get, get the problem sorted? So these are all the kinds of questions that you might have when you deal with this problem. Now, these are all uh, what um, we um, call foreground questions. So as opposed to background questions, which don't necessarily relate to the problem at hand, which could be things like what causes appendicitis or what's the relationship between say, acute appendicitis and ulcerative colitis, for example, or, or what are the molecular me mechanisms in the development of appendicitis? So those kinds of questions would be background questions, which we don't often concern uh, ourselves about in the management of uh, uh, our patients. So just focusing on the foreground questions, there are all these questions that come to your mind, and these are in some ways not necessarily structured or not necessarily very clear. So you can't jump from this stage to looking at the evidence. So the thing to do is to start to 
construct a question that is focused and also at the same time clinically relevant. You won't ask a question that is going to help you uh, move forward the management of your patient. So, for example, you might be thinking, I need to talk to the patient. So um, I need to be able to explain to the patient the likelihood of appendicitis. So I would really like to know what the likelihood of ap acute appendicitis or other significant pathology is in such patients. Another focused and relevant question would be, what is the effectiveness of laparoscopy in such patients over continued monitoring? Because that would be the um, fallback option. A third focus question could be, if I've decided to uh, monitor, which is better? Should I may keep the patient in hospital for 24 hours or 12 hours? Or uh, am I safe in discharging the patient, send them home, um, you know, don't waste a bed, that kind of thing in this group of patients. The key here is in such patients. So we've got to be um, clear about what kind of patients we're talking about. What is the cohort we're interested in? And that needs to be clearly defined. And here the, the, the cohort will be patients with clinically um, suspected appendicitis, but normal inflammatory markers and normal cross-sectional imaging. So that would be our cohort. The other thing to think about is when you ask a question um, saying, which is better, which treatment is better, A or B, say monitoring in hospital, or early discharge, assuming you're not going to operate, you've got to think about better for whom. Are we talking about um, better in terms of the patient or better for the hospital provider? Uh, hopefully not better for you as a surgeon. Also better in what way? Um, for the patient, is it pain? Is it quality of life? Is it readmission with um, severe pain? And, and, and also think about how much better by how, what degree? Um, how much of an improvement are you hoping to, uh, to, 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 to see between the two uh, treatment options? So those are things to think about. So firstly, you've got to construct, uh, construct um, or think about a focus question and the question that is obviously clinically relevant. There's no point asking questions that uh, is not relevant to your management. The next is you have to improve the clarity of questions and also add detail where necessary to be able to go about and acquire the evidence to answer the question. So this is where you probably all heard of the PICO format, the PICO format comes in handy. So just for completion's sake, I'll expand on the PICO. The P in PICO stands for population, which is the patient group or cohort that is of interest to you. The second is the um, is, uh, I is for intervention, which refers to the intervention or the exposure that is uh, being considered. C is comparator or the control or standard treatment. And O is the outcome of interest or the key outcome of interest. Now, the PICO format is perfect for questions on therapy and harm, as uh, for example, which treatment is better or is this particular treatment uh, of increased risk? but it's also quite useful for a number of questions on risk and prognosis and on questions relating to diagnosis as well. So going back to the three questions we had formulated, let's just take one of those questions, the last question, which was which treatment is better, monitoring in hospital or early discharge in such patients? So here you've assumed that you're not going to operate, you're going to keep an eye. And the question is, in such situations, is early discharge with appropriate advice uh, better or at least good enough, as good as monitoring in hospital? The obvious advantage being that uh, you don't occupy a bed. So in this particular uh, research question, the population obviously will be patients with clinically suspected appendicitis in the absence of raised inflammatory markers and a normal CT scan. So that's a very clearly defined patient group. And that's what you need. The intervention would be early discharge with details on how you're going to discharge, what advice you'd, advice you'd give, and when would you follow up, and so on and so forth. And the C, the comparator would be monitoring in hospital. And O, the outcome uh, could be, for example, unplanned readmission to hospital within 30 days. But this is just an example. You could have uh, a couple of key outcomes and a number of secondary outcomes that you might want to compare 
in the intervention arm um, to the comparator arm. And, and then you can make your mind up as to whether um, uh, early discharge is good enough or better than monitoring. Okay, right. So the, the other uh, couple of things to think about when you uh, structure a question in the PICO format is that sometimes you don't necessarily have the intervention and comparative groups as separate groups. You might just have one group. And this is particularly the case in uh, when you're trying to address research questions that are uh, aiming to determine the natural history of the disease or prognosis. Let's say, for example, you want to say, you want to answer the question, what is the risk of representation with perforated appendicitis in this cohort? In that kind of uh, setting with that research question, all you need is a large group of patients where you manage conservatively uh, and followed them over a period of time to determine the risk of uh, representation with perforation. So in that kind of cohort, you just have one group, you don't have separate intervention and control groups. Um, the other slight modification of the PICO uh, format proposed by some people is the addition of T, P-I-C-O-T, where T might, might either stand for time, uh, where, it, uh, where it then means time of outcome. So if in our example, we said 30 day unplanned readmission is the outcome, 30 day is the time. So you're being very specific about uh, the 30 days. I mean, it could be three months, it could be six months, but there are reasons why you've chosen 30 days. And deciding on that um, uh, early on when you're trying to address a question is also quite important. Some other people would suggest that when you say T, when you think of the PCOT framework, consider the type of study that you're going to be interested in, the type of study that will help you answer your question. Now, ideally, for most research questions, you have a question in mind uh, and you're going to look for studies, uh, you would be looking for a systematic review and a meta-analysis. And if that's been performed, that obviously uh, takes uh, all of the primary research studies that have been published on that topic into consideration. And that will give you a summation or a, sum, uh, a summary of the uh, key outcomes in the groups you're interested in. However, a systematic review is not always available. Sometimes it may not be relevant for the specifics of the P code that you're interested in, or it might be a systematic review that's 10, 15 years out of date and things have moved on and you don't have a more recent review. So a systematic review and meta-analysis would be the type of study you'd probably go for to answer any um, clinical question, but they're often not available. So if you exclude systematic reviews, which are secondary research, then the ideal type of primary research that you're interested in to answer your question really depends on the type of question or on the category of question. So here's a little table to explain this further. So most clinical research questions, as um, I've explained before in a previous talk, can be classified into um, one of these categories. So they could be a question on therapy um, uh, or, or prevention. There could be a question on risk of prognosis. There could be questions on diagnosis. And I've uh, highlighted this in two separate rows. I'll come back to this in a minute. Or there could be a question on costs. You might say, I'm interested in discharging patients home early because we, we, are, we don't have the funds and, and resources, and we are interested in minimizing resources. So it could be a question on costs. Now, based on the category to which your research question fits in, the type of primary research that you might be interested in might vary. So if you're interested in a therapy question, you're looking for RCTs. Ideally, if you don't have RCTs, then you look at controlled non-randomized trials. And if you don't have that, then you look at observational studies. If, however, you're looking at a question that falls into the risk or prognosis category, then it's usually a cohort study. And if you don't have a cohort study, you're looking at case control or a case series. Now, these are all obviously observational studies. When it comes to diagnosis, there's a little catch. 
Now, if you're looking at, say, diagnosing appendicitis with a, um, with a new um, imaging technology, let's say um, a five Tesla MRI or something, if the question is, is that new test a good diagnostic test in that does it improve the accuracy of the diagnosis of appendicitis? And the kind of study you're interested in is probably a cross-section study with a gold standard that, uh, that will establish a diagnosis of appendicitis. I mean, that itself can become a bit controversial, but, but that's what you're looking for. However, if you're looking at a diagnostic study that is going to improve health outcomes in some particular way, uh, let's say reduce the risk of, uh, or reduce hospital stay, um, uh, for example, then you consider that diagnostic test along with any intervention that follows the test as a therapy, and therefore look for studies just like you would look for studies on therapy. So if you're looking at a diagnostic test with a particular health outcome in mind, then you look for uh, the study uh, primary research, just like you would look for a therapy study, which would be randomized controlled trials. If on the other hand, you're looking at the diagnostic test with just the accuracy of the diagnosis in mind, then the type of study you're looking for is a cross-sectional study. Okay. And then finally, for questions on costs, you're going to be looking for economic anal um, uh, analysis, studies that have done economic analysis in detail. So effectively, uh, we have talked about formulating a clear and focused, answerable, relevant clinical question and formulating that question in the PICO or the PCOT format and looking for studies, primary we're talking about primary research here, that is based on the type of question whether it's a question relating to therapy or to risk or to prognosis, diagnosis or cost. Okay, so that comes to the end of this um, short um, talk. So to summarize, we've talked about study designs very briefly and their role in evidence-based medicine. We talk about the importance of asking the right um, clinical question. And asking the right question is the first step in the practice of evidence-based medicine. So before you go on to acquire your evidence by searching through databases, you could ask the correct question so you know what type of studies to look for. I briefly mentioned background questions, but we've been talking about foreground questions, which are questions relating to the clinical problem uh, at hand. We talk about the PICO format or the PCOT format with a T. And uh, we talked about the link between the type of question or the category of question and the primary study design. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>